What is up, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of History Behind the Horror. I'm your host, Tane. For tonight's episode, we're going to be talking about Sebastian from The Evil Within. Now, I know we haven't touched on The Evil Within series in a very long time, and that's the reason why I'm going to be doing it tonight. And another big reason why is because a lot of people recently have been coming to me asking me to get back into the series and do Sebastian specifically. So, remember, guys, if you would love to see more Evil Within in the near future, make sure you guys like this video and also share the video based off those numbers. It lets me know that you guys really want to see more and i will get more out as soon as i can so with that being said thank you guys so much for tuning in to tonight's episode and as always i hope you all enjoy the video Owing to his troubled past, Sebastian has a constantly tired and worn look to him in stark contrast to his more well-groomed partner joseph oda he has a gaunt face married with scars and a light 5 o'clock shadow that turned into a full beard by 2017. Due to stress and the time skip between the games, Sebastian's hair had become even more wild and unkempt than it used to be, and he also has a more wrinkled face in the sequel. During his early years, Sebastian's attire consisted of mostly a blue dress shirt with black tie and pants along with brown dress shoes. At the time of the Beacon Mental Hospital incident, Sebastian wore a standard yet withered KCPD detective uniform consisting of a white shirt and pinstripe wrist coat along with a matching loose tie. Around the buckle of his faded brown trousers are a multitude of pouches and clamps for his various police gadgets. And he also wore a shoulder rig with a cross draw holster for his sidearm. Sebastian would always wear a faded trench coat given to him by his ex-wife while on the field until he lost it in the incident. Sebastian's outfit in the sequel is in many ways similar to the first game, though he now wears a dark greenish gray v-neck polo shirt instead, and his tool belt is now more generic than before. He also wore a dark gray coat prior to his unwilling recruitment by Mobius. At the very end of the second game, Sebastian wears a white shirt, a blue jean jacket, beige pants, and brown shoes. As he was never officially divorced from his wife, Sebastian still wears their silver wedding ring. Before the series began, Sebastian is said to have been very energetic and confident, and at times very emotional. He was very passionate about everything he did and was very idealistic. His career was on the fast track and he rose through the ranks really quickly thanks to his enthusiasm for his job and in protecting his home, Crimson City. He is also a very loving husband and father and is often heard being grateful for having his family in his life. However, he had the tendency to bury his head in his work, neglecting to spend as much time as he wanted with them. After the tragedy that befell his family, however, Sebastian fell into depression and became merely a shell of his former self, turning to alcohol and smoking to ease the pain. His self-esteem took a rapid nosedive and he began blaming himself for all that has happened. He also became much more cynical, distant, and sarcastic, though the traumas in his life have also toughened him up, making him much more strong-willed and fearless. Despite this cold front, however, Sebastian still has the capacity for caring and selflessness as he had offered to help those on his journey on several occasions. Owing to the many perils their involvement had put him through, Sebastian understandably holds a deep grudge against Mobius, though he's quick to mellow out if an affiliated individual is not on the same page as their employers. All in all, Sebastian's mannerisms and personality heavily resembles those of the classic hardboiled detective, which was insinuated by Julie Kidman on her first day of working with him. Not much is known about Sebastian's early life prior to his police career other than him being a Crimson City native. During his time in the police force, Sebastian originally held the rank of sergeant prior to being promoted to the crime division where he met his junior agent and later wife Myra Hansen. Despite their differences in ideology, the duo hit it off surprisingly well, leading to good field synergy and cooperation. This partnership soon turned into a full-scale romance, one that was escalated by Myra's field injury and sick leave. Soon after, they were married, and the fruit of their union was their loving daughter, Lily. Sebastian's life was idyllic, being a loving husband and father, but even so, buried himself in work. But his happiness was not to last, as a house fire burned down Sebastian's family home, and presumably his five-year-old daughter along with it. Worse yet, his wife began acting strangely afterwards, seemingly convinced that the fire was staged and their daughter wasn't dead. 
In full denial of the truth, however, Sebastian brushed aside Myra's pleading and insisted on moving on with their lives. Myra herself disappeared soon after, causing Sebastian to sink even deeper into despair and turn to alcohol and cigarettes to wash the grief away. Slowly, however, his passion for work eroded as well as his sense of perspective and composure as he further spiraled into despair. Shortly after his wife's disappearance, Sebastian's new partner, Joseph Oda, who was assigned to him as Myra's replacement, noticed his alcoholic streak and reported the case to Eternal Affairs in an attempt to get his partner back on track. While it did save Sebastian's career, it ultimately put a great strain on their relationship, since the time Sebastian had returned to his job but is never without his hip flask. He still feels responsible for the tragedies that befell him and shrugs off any offers of help. At some point, Sebastian was assigned to mentor a new detective, Julie Kidman. He showed her the ropes and treated her as an equal despite her age. He was impressed when she was able to break their first case on her own. The series plotline begins with Sebastian, Joseph, and Julie being driven to the Beacon Mental Hospital by Officer Oscar Connolly, sent there to investigate the reported multiple murders following the disappearance of the previous dispatch. As they arrive at the scene, Sebastian and Joseph went inside to find the aftermath of what looks to be a massacre with only one survivor, the hospital's chief of staff, Dr. Marcello. While Joseph tends to the shaken doctor, Sebastian goes through the CCTV footage and finds the previous dispatch being taken out by a cloaked supernatural assailant, who unknowingly to him has appeared in the room and was ready to strike. Sebastian turned around just in time for the hooded man to stab him, knocking him out. Are you injured? What happened here? Can't be real. Impossible. Ruvik is... I've got him. The security cameras might tell us something. He then wakes up in a strange basement and finds himself hung by his feet amongst several corpses. A large masked man then appears, forcing Sebastian to play dead until he returns to his kitchen, at which point Sebastian manages to cut himself loose with a knife he retrieved from a nearby corpse, lifts the keys from a meat hook and makes his escape. Before he could leave, however, Sebastian accidentally trips an alarm wire alerting the mass butcher to his attempt, who then manages to chase him down and cripple him with a chainsaw wound to the leg. Despite his leg injury, Sebastian manages to escape into the sewers and outmaneuvering the man once more to make it to an escape elevator where he is taken to safety.
at the top of the elevator, an earthquake occurs, forcing Sebastian to flee the building. He manages to escape but finds Crimson City itself crumbling apart. Officer Connolly then arrives in the ambulance, beckoning him to hurry up as the ground beneath the vehicle gives away. Sebastian barely makes it in as Connolly drives with the roadway crumbling beneath him. Unknown to them, the figure from before observes as they drive away and disappears from view soon after. As Crimson City continues to fall apart around them, Sebastian is informed that Joseph never made it out of the hospital. Leslie, an asylum patient, begins repeating the words fine and is comforted throughout the ride by Kidman and the doctor they found earlier. After a long run through the devastated city, Sebastian looks up at the rearview mirror and sees the hooded figure standing with the backseat passengers. Shocked, he looks back only to see Kidman, Leslie, and the doctor. The ambulance begins losing control as Connolly appears to the grave. Leslie's chanting changes from fine to fall, which turns out to be right as the ambulance then falls off a cliff. Sebastian then blacks out when the ambulance hits the ground. Hey, where's Joseph? Man, I'm sorry, but you never came out. I waited, but... Uh, please, settle down, uh, Leslie. Settle down. Just a few bumps, we're fine. Fine, fine, fine. We will be once we're fine. far away. Fine. A little further and we'll be fine. Fine, 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 fine. Fall! Fall! After having a nightmare of seeing a long haunted crawling up to him, Sebastian wakes up in a hospital and the setting is filtered black and white. As Sebastian heads towards the door, a nurse appears and escorts him from his room. He is then asked to sign in so he is to not lose his future memories. Sebastian is then escorted further into an anonymous looking room with a single leather chair in the middle. At the nurse's coaxing, Sebastian eventually sits down in the chair. Strangely, the chair then changes into a metal chair. Before Sebastian can get up, the chair latches onto his hands and legs, trapping him. With the jar found earlier in Sebastian's room, the player unlocks access to Sebastian's mind. This is later used as a way to upgrade Sebastian's abilities with the green gel found throughout the game. After Sebastian uses the gel, he asks the nurse if he is going crazy. The room then bursts into flames after the nurse replies, Now what makes you say that? Lady, am I going crazy? Now what makes you say that? 
Sebastian then awakes to realize that he was in the destroyed ambulance after it fell off the cliff in the previous chapter, explaining why the room burst into flames before. He then staggers out of the wreckage gravely injured. As he proceeds to wander through the forest that the ambulance landed in, he finds a tent with a man crouched over something. Sebastian picks up a revolver and approaches the man. After turning around, the man is revealed to be Officer Connolly eating a head. Sebastian kills the reanimated Connolly and continues. He then finds Leslie behind a tripwire, indirectly saving Sebastian from death. Leslie runs away before he could help. Making his way through the haunted, Sebastian witnesses the process of becoming the haunted. While being chased by a horde of haunted, Sebastian makes it to the exit which is blocked by a gate. To escape, Sebastian jumps into the water below the bridge. The chasing haunted give up and leave. Shit. Better get out of here. Sebastian trudges out of the water and comes to a village. In the village, he finds the same doctor from the hospital. Upon tracking him down and confronting him, the doctor introduces himself as Marcelo, explaining that Leslie was one of his patients and went through the nearby closed gates. As the horde of haunted builds up, Marcelo volunteers to distract the creatures while Sebastian goes for the gates. The gate has no crank and is unmovable. Sebastian realizes that he needs a chainsaw to cut through the chains. He then encounters the sadist from chapter 1 who is restrained by chains. The sadist breaks free and after a long tough battle, Sebastian kills him and uses his chainsaw to open the gates. As he and Marcelo walk through the gate, it shuts itself behind their back. Leslie should be just ahead. It is imperative that we find him. Oh, the hospice. Yes. Leslie was being treated here years ago. He'd come here thinking it was familiar and safe. You know where we are. Just ahead is the hospice my brother runs. He'll take us in. That didn't answer my question. I honestly don't know. For all I know, I'm losing my mind and you're just a delusion. But I'd like to think I still have a shred of dignity and an obligation to protect my patient. As an officer of the law, you should too. I hope his brother's not a jerk too. Marcelo informs Sebastian that his brother Valrio, who cared for Leslie before him, runs a host spice not too far from the entrance. Once they entered the host spice, they found Valrio with his back turned, performing surgery on a man. When Sebastian approaches Valrio, it is shown that Valrio isn't saving the man, but instead mindlessly slicing him open. Valrio himself is revealed to have turned into one of the haunted as well. After Sebastian kills him in front of Marcelo, a vision of Valrio's living death is shown. Valrio is beginning to cut open the same man but begins complaining of an itch on his head. Valrio then scratches his head so much he tears off a portion of his own scalp, completing the transformation. Marcelo then starts mumbling about how Ruvik couldn't have killed Valrio.
Leslie then screams from outside, running into a house. Sebastian and Marcelo chase after Leslie into the basement. After reaching Leslie, the door appears to open by itself, until Sebastian is attacked by an invisible haunted, forcing Sebastian to kill it to proceed. When they go back to the stairs, it turns into a wall. Ruvik appears and separates Sebastian from Leslie and Marcelo into an unknown area. Sebastian makes his way through the hospital and eventually encounters a powerful four-armed monster named Laura. Sebastian narrowly escapes, but then is sent into a different area of the hospital as a result of Ruvik's manipulation of the environment. He's gone down there. Did you take care of him? Help me. Leslie. Help me. Oh, thank heavens. <laughs> Dr. Hermenis is here. Settle <laughs> down. Wait, <laughs> Doc. I think something's coming. Something here. Settle down. <laughs> be collectively losing our minds 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 oh god no rovik it is you ah! Listen. who the um, hell are you uh, 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 no don't follow what the? Doctor? Leslie? Fuck. Making his way through a hospital wing full of invisible haunted and deadly puzzles, Sebastian finds Joseph connected to a bathtub. After freeing his partner and healing him, the duo continue together as they make their way out of the partition. However, Sebastian begins to worry after Joseph makes a brief transformation into a haunted, attempting to throttle him. What is it with this sound? I thought it was something electronic. <laughs> Joseph, after Connolly, I thought... I, I don't know what came over me. <coughs> I, I haven't been feeling well, but... <sighs> Look, let's just get out of here. There's something wrong with this place. Yeah. After escaping, they discover Kidman trapped inside a tank filled with rising water. Together, both of them fight off several waves of haunted in the area, some armed with sticks of dynamite, before they can come to her aid. Upon examination, Joseph tells Sebastian that to open the tank, a code must be used on a panel. Sebastian must unlock the tank before Kidman drowns. Kidman! Get me out of this thing! Wait a minute. It's another trap. 
Look. Huh? It's much more like. After getting Kidman out, she and Joseph are then separated from Sebastian to the sword below, and Sebastian quickly follows. As they reunite again, the trio then are separated yet again by Laura. Sebastian is brought to the area where Laura is when he discovers that fire is the creature's ultimate weakness. After seemingly bringing her down, Sebastian moves on and goes into a room with the STEM machine. He sees a flashback with Ruvik conducting an experiment on Leslie, determining him as the first to survive linking to his brain. Snapping back to reality, the machine becomes active, releasing three haunted which are manually connected to the machine. Sebastian must knock them down and pull out the cord to defeat them, causing the machine to violently erupt, knocking Sebastian unconscious. Are you alright? Fire seems to work. Go home. Go home. Subject's case history cites developmental delays. Indicates issues with communication. Social cognition. Repetitive behaviors. Signs of synesthesia reported. Genealogy suggests increased susceptibility to external stimuli. Pattern adaptiveness. Could you be what I've been searching for all these years? And under my own nose? Unbelievable. There can be no mistake. This one is... compatible. And that ends part one of tonight's episode. If you would love to see a part two made of this, make sure you guys like the video and make sure you guys also share it. By those numbers, it lets me know that you guys would love to see part two and I would love to make part two available for you guys very soon. Also, make sure you guys hit the bell notification so you always stay up to date when a new video is released. And hit the subscribe button because there's some things coming up soon that I'm sure you wouldn't want to miss. With that being said, thank you guys so much for tuning in to this episode and I will see you all on the next episode of History Behind the Horror.